invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Um, so good to be back this weekend. Terry and I are glad to be with you this weekend. And uh, Terry, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. So, yeah. We spent a few days in Branson, hung out together, went out, went trout fishing together, stayed in a really neat location um, up by Silver Dollar City. Uh, we didn't go to Silver Dollar City because we don't like that. But anyway, after all, um, all, after all that, we're uh, still married and still love each other, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, on a serious note, um, I do want to say this. Happy 25th, babe. Um, happy anniversary. I'm very, 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 very happy to be married to you. And on top of that, I'm happier now than I've ever been with you. So I love you. And uh, just can you guys give I – I know it's both of us, but – Give her a hand. She, she deals with a lot for me. So uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, open up Hebrews chapter uh, 4. And we're going to begin a brand new series this morning um, called Sola Scriptura. And as, we go into, as we're going to examine the Word of God, and uh, maybe you're here for the first time, and maybe you've uh, been to a few churches, and some churches uh, seem to place somewhat of a an importance on the Word of God. Uh, then there are other churches that don't seem to do so at all. Um, and so then there are a lot of churches out there that exclude pieces of Scripture because they want to they want to they want to fit to the culture. They want to fit to what's around them. And the problem with that is is that how many of you believe that when God says something, He means it? How many of you believe that when God says something, he's serious about it, amen? And so um, I'm just saying uh, t they'll take parts out that they don't like um, or picking and choosing certain portions to believe or not to believe because they are less comfortable with that particular part of Scripture. Um, and I think it's important to ask this morning, why? Why would somebody do that? Why is the Word of God important? Why is the Word of God a big deal? I believe there are a lot of Christians... And I believe there's Christians in this room that don't know the answer to that question. In fact, uh, uh, the watershed mantra, and I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit here just for a second, uh, really of the Reformation, if you go back uh, to the Reformers, who said uh, that the Scriptures were to be alone. In other words, sola scriptura, sola meaning alone, scriptura meaning scripture. This was the cry of the reformers. I mean, who said, you know, we go back to the scripture alone. And out of that came sola Christus. In other words, how many of you believe it's Christ alone as well? I mean, there, there is no other name under heaven by which we might be saved. Amen? It's Jesus Christ. Um, uh, sola gratia, in other words, the idea of grace alone. How many of you believe that God's grace, if it wasn't for God's grace, you would not have salvation? Amen? Uh, uh, sola five. So you start looking at these, um, you know, faith alone. Uh, you start looking at sola de, de gloria. I mean, you look at all of these different uh, pieces here. Uh, the glory of God is so important. How many of you believe it's God's glory that we, we live for? Amen? And so it all started with sola scriptura. And basically what was happening, and I'll explain more later in this series, they were rejecting the traditions of men as a parallel source of divinity and coming back to scripture alone instead of just putting their faith in the church. Um, it's, it's, it's important because so many people today simply don't understand the importance of God's word. Um, now, throughout history, okay, um, it's been common uh, to people to actually uh, stand during the reading of God's word. And, and I would like to do something a little bit different this morning. This is just different because in honor of, of God's word, I know we don't do this every single Sunday, but in, in, in honor of the living word of God, because I, I want to make a point to us this morning. In honor of the living word of God, would you stand just for a moment with your Bibles um, if you don't have your Bible, it's okay. We're going to put that on the, on the board today. Uh, but in honor of the living word of God, let's stand together as we read God's word. Reading today from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And I just want you to see this. This is what the word of God says. It says this, for the word of God is, it's alive. The word of God's not dead. The word of God is alive. And it's, it's powerful. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It, it exposes our innermost thoughts. When you don't think nobody knows what's going on in your life, I'm telling you, God knows what's going on in your life. 
When you don't think things are the way that they should be, and maybe you're not willing to say God knows what's going on in your heart. And so I just want you right now, I want, I want us just to bow our heads and, and close our eyes. Lord Jesus, Lord, we need your presence here today. Lord God, if, if you don't show up, um, I'm not here to, to, to impress people with words, but what I am here to do is, Lord, to show people your power. And the, and the word of God has so much power. Your word has life in it. It has breath in it. I pray that somehow, that Lord, that you would supernaturally do what I can't do and that you would bring life to people this morning. Lord, that you would somehow show people the importance of being in your word, God. Lord that, you would, Lord, that you would just make it come on like a light bulb, God. That people would get it. Lord, that people would understand why, Lord God, there is no power outside of your word. We need your presence. We need your, we need your, we need you, we need your help this morning. Come and do what we can't do today. In your name. And everybody in this house said... Um, before you're seated, just as you're seated, maybe say God's word is all that and then some. Just turn to your neighbor and just tell him that real quick before you're seated. The God's word is all that and then some. Scripture says that this book is alive. It's not just words on a page, but it's It's living. It's active. It's life transforming. It's powerful. It's active in every single way. I'm going to throw this to you because this thing is blinking and it's making me crazy. Um, and so, you know, it's yet even even though it is alive, so many people today, and I'm not talking about just non-believers, but I'm talking about people in the church as well. They neglect God's word. I mean, you look at it, I mean, for example, how many of you right now, you own a Bible, raise your hand high. You own a Bible, just raise it as high as you can. You, not, not your Bible, but you, just your hand, raise it. Um, okay, good. Everybody pretty much in this room, I mean, I, there may be a couple people that don't. If you don't, come see me, I would love to get you a Bible. But most of us in the room have a Bible. How many of you own one, uh, uh, more than one Bible? You own two Bibles, at least. Okay, man, we, we are not short. How many of you, and I want you to be honest, put your hands back down. Um, how many of you would say this week you did not read your Bible one time? Raise your hand. Be honest. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Now, you know, um, I, you can put your hands back down. What, what happened? I'm asking this question because what has happened? I mean, because we have, think about this for a second, we have God's Word so readily available I mean, think about all of the ways we have it. I mean, we, we have God's word in every, every way possible, um, but yet so many of us neglect it. Here's what Scripture says, and I want you to see this in Psalm 119. It says this. He says this. I said, I, he says, I delight in your decrees. I will not what? I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. The word neglect, by the way, it comes from the Hebrew word shakak, and we get our word shakakan from it. I'm just kidding. Uh, but shakak, shakak is, it, it means to, to lay aside. It means to put away. It means to forget. It means to, you know, if you're taking notes, it means to take for granted or just to completely neglect. I, I will delight in your decrees, Psalm 119 says, the psalmist says. I will not lay aside your word. I will not forget your word. I will not take your, your, your word for granted. I will not neglect your word. But truth is, there are so many, and I'm just saying this because I, I believe I've been praying. We have been praying. Uh, I know Wednesday nights is, is not happening right now, but Sunday mornings, we're praying Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Um, come fall, we'll pray both again. And so, uh, but right now we're praying on Sunday mornings. We're praying, we're believing that God is going to wake America up. I'm not talking about wake them up politically. A lot of people think we need to wake up politically. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about politics. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about when Jesus gets involved, all the other stuff is going to change. When Jesus gets involved, stuff happens. 
When there's an awakening that happens, there's an awakening in people's spirits and in their lives. And what happens is the stuff that used to fix them doesn't fix them anymore. They go toward Jesus. And so all they, all they can think about in this cultural Christian society that I see happening in America. America is in desperate need of an awakening. And, and what I see is, is the cultural, the normal church consumer is just consume, consume, consume. Do something for me. Do something for me. Do something for me. Do something for me. I want you to do this stuff for me. This, can you please, can you just, can, I mean, pastor, I just, I just need you to do this for me. And I'm not talking about just the pastor, but I'm talking, you look at the church world, and what you have is you have a bunch of me-centered folks that are just constantly, all about themselves. It's not that they're not against, it's not that they're not for anybody else, it's just they're for themselves so much they can't pay attention to anybody else. And so we have all these cultural Christians who consume, 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 and all they can think about is themselves. And one of the main reasons is, is the Bible is not living and it's not active in their life. I mean, so this morning, I mean, they, 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 may, they may be culturally Christian and have the T-shirt. They may, they may listen to the music. They may listen to the, the worship. They might even like the worship. They, the, but the Bible is not living, and the Bible is not active in their life because they, they never pick it up. And so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They got, they got time for Facebook. They got time for hanging out with friends. They got time for, for Walmart. They got time for date night. They got time for, you know, just a little relaxation in the tub. But they haven't yet figured out that there is food from heaven that others know nothing about. And so they take it for granted. Shakak. Shekak has taken over. I mean, neglecting the Word of God, laying aside the Word of God, putting the Word of God away. And when a believer lays aside and neglects the Word of God, they begin to do things like this. They begin to sin. That's what happens. Sin creeps in. And so because it's only when His Word will I hide in my heart that I might not against God. And so because we recognize this is a huge problem in the church world, we do things like this. We have, these, we have people recognizing that, hey, how do, we get, how do we get the Bible into people's hearts? How do we get the Bible into it? And so what we have now is we have unprecedented help. I mean, think online. All of the tools, you can just Google something and boom, it pops up all these different. Now, it may be wrong, so be careful. But I'm just saying, like, you can, you can pop up theological questions and boom, they get answered just like that. There have been websites launched, things like version. How many you're using you version right now okay so i mean is that a bad thing no it's a wonderful thing is it not i mean it's been created so we can use it many of you recognize it's the app that you download it's simply a, a tool to help people all over the world engage in scripture and and as of this week i just want you to hear this there have been 328 million downloads as of tuesday this week that's great i mean that's awesome but it's, it's really a tool to help you interact with God, the God of the Bible. And so it's, it's so, so important to engage in God's Word that a tool has been built for people around the world to help with Scripture. Now, why? Why is that? Well, because the Word of God is alive. I mean, God is, it's the Word of God. It's living. It's active. Scripture says that in the beginning... There was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made a dwelling among us. What are we talking about? This is Jesus. It's the Word of God, the Word of life, becoming flesh to know Him, uh, to, to serve Him, to, to follow Him. We must feed on His Word, and yet so many people... Shekak. So many people neglect it. Why is it that so many people today neglect God's word? Why is it that so many people, you know, they, they claim to be a Christian. They claim to walk the walk. They might even talk the talk. But the truth is, is the relationship is not there because there is no life because they have shakak the word of God. They have neglected God's word. They have said, hey, you know what? I believe it practically, but I really don't live it in the way I should. Part of the reason is because so many people today do not understand what it really is. The Word of God, what it, what it took 
for you, if you have your Bible, I just want you to do this for me. If you have your Bible, even if it's on a, a device, I just want you to hold it up. Can you do that? Do you realize what it took for that to happen? Most people don't. I mean, today we are going to study the history of the Bible. And some of you may be like, what? Yeah, we're going to study the history of the Bible for a moment. I mean, let's talk about how God brought his word to us. I mean, it started thousands and thousands of years ago, somewhere between 1400 and 1500 B.C., when God himself wrote the Ten Commandments. I mean, he wrote them on stone, and he ascribed these very first words of God in ancient in an ancient form of Hebrew, and God gave the Ten Commandments to, to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, and God began speaking His Word to us. Years later, the very first scriptures, they were known uh, as the Pentateuch. In other words, it was the first five books of the Old Testament, and they are now uh, included in our canon. They, they include Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And for thousands and thousands of years, I mean, Scripture was recorded on animal skins that were called scrolls. I mean, you look at them and a, a scribe might use the animal skin of a deer. A, a, a scribe might use the animal skin of a cow or maybe even a sheep. Never, ever a pig. A pig would have been unclean and that would have been totally inappropriate for God's Word. What's interesting is, is when the entire Pentateuch is found on a scroll, it's called a Torah. And a Torah scroll, if it would be completely unraveled, would be over 150 feet. Some of you may be like, well, how long is that? Well, from that wall to that wall is 100 feet. So you take that and add half more again from that wall out into the parking lot. And so the scroll was so long that it, uh, that it would often take an entire herd of sheep, if you think of it that way, just to make one Torah scroll uh, by approximately... 500 B.C., the 39 books that we know today as the Old Testament were completed and continue to be preserved in Hebrew on scrolls. By the first century A.D., the New Testament was completed. And it was preserved in the Greek language on papyrus, a thin paper material made from clush, uh, f- uh, flush, flattened uh, uh, stalks of a reed-like plant. And, and so in the year 367, uh, the bishop of Alexandria, Andrea, a, a guy by the name of Athenius, Athanasius, excuse me, uh, he writes this Easter letter, and in it he listed all the books that you read today in the New Testament. And then in the year 393 A.D., the African Synod of Hippo approved all of the books that you find listed in your New Testament today. By the year 500 A.D., The Bible had been translated into over 500 different languages. I mean, people from all over were so thankful because they could actually read the Word of God in their own language. But then something very, very, very serious happened. In just the next century, the next 100 years, by the year 600 A.D., the Bible was only allowed in one language. Why is that? Some of you may be, well, why would that happen? I mean, well, let me just tell you this. A good thing can go really bad if it gets offset and it doesn't follow the word of God. A a really good thing can be really bad if you don't follow God's word. And so I'm just looking at this, and the Catholic Church of Rome at the time was the only recognized church in the land, and they issued this decree that no Bible in any other language would be allowed. And if anyone found a Bible in any language besides Latin, that person holding the Bible could be executed on the spot. And you may be wondering, well, why did that happen? Why, why would something like this happen? Well, unfortunately, the Catholic Church became very, very corrupt at that time. and the, the priests were the only ones educated in the Latin language so that the common person could never, ever read God's word. And well, that gave the priests ultimate authority. 
it gave them authority that, you know, whatever is being said, I mean, it's just up to them that whether or not the truth gets said. And so they could teach what parts of the Bible they wanted to. And they could even throw in some things that weren't in the Bible at, at all. And, and, and that was very, very, very common back then. In fact, it was common for a person to go and pay for indulgences. And in a sense, they were paying for forgiveness. Imagine that. I mean, let me just tell you something. The, the cost of the blood of Jesus was very high. It took God's own son, his blood, to actually fix the problem that you and I have called sin. But the truth is, is that for us to try to make money off of it is a bad idea. And so in a sense, they were paying for forgiveness. And if they sinned, they'd pay a certain amount of money. And the priest would say, well, you know, because you paid that, now you're forgiven. And so the Catholic Church also taught about a place called purgatory, a word that's not even found in Scripture. But, but they said if your relative dies, they go to purgatory, kind of, kind of like a holding place, a place uh, that you really don't want to be. Uh, but if a certain amount of money, for a certain amount of money, I mean, you can purchase the freedom for your relatives from purgatory. And so in today's world, it would be, be kind of like this. I mean, you come to church this morning, and maybe your grandma has passed away, and, and you're like, you know what? I, I just really want to make sure she's in heaven. So, And I, you walk up to me, and you say, can I, can I make sure that my grandma is in heaven? And I would say, yeah, sure, for $9,995. And so this is, this is the way to buy grandma a ticket into heaven out of purgatory the priests used this force forced ignorance in between the years 400 AD and uh, the four, and 1400 AD they deceived the masses during this thousand year period which became known as in the history books you'll read it it's called the dark ages so you may be wondering well how did the church break free from that I mean, how in the world did the church break free from this long season of dark and horrible corruption? Well, the answer is simple. The Word of God is so powerful. It is so powerful that it will not be thwarted. It will not be put down. It will not be kept down because guess whose Word it is? It's His Word. It's the Word of God. It's all-powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the answer is so simple. Once the Bible, the truth of God's Word, got in the hands of enough people and the right people, God used His truth through people, to bring about the, rest, the very necessary reformation of the church. And here's how, kinda, here's how, how that happened, kind of. In the year 563, I can't possibly give you the entire history lesson on a Sunday morning in 40 minutes. It's just not possible. But anyway, the year 563 A.D., there was a guy named Columba. Um, you may have seen his television show. He's a guy with a glass eye, Columbo, you know. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Sorry. Uh, seriously, uh, 563. A.D. Columba was a guy who started a secret Bible society or a Bible school where they could actually faithfully teach God's word. And, and this group of people became the, the remnant on earth where God's word was taught faithfully century after century after century. The students, they were known as the Coldies. In fact, the first man to be called a Koldi, if you go back in history by tradition only, you begin to look at it, and it says that Joseph of Arimathea was one of those. And if you remember a guy that uh, he gave his tomb up for Jesus, and so, but Koldi is a term that literally means certain stranger. And they were strangers of this world, like we preached last, last month with Peculiar. But for 700 years, the Coldies would disciple one another, and they would faithfully study the Word of God. And in fact, it was out of this group that God raised up different people, the right people, to bring about the Reformation. In fact, in the late 1300s, one of these guys, a guy by the name of John Wycliffe, how many of you ever heard of that name, John Wycliffe? Or some would pronounce it Wycliffe. Uh, he was a, it was a man that God used to do some tremendous things. I mean, in fact, he was the very first guy to translate the Bible uh, into the English language. And when he did so, here's what happened. All of a sudden, all these people who couldn't read Scripture were able to do so now. And at this time, some say that it would take about 10 months to translate one single Bible. 10 months People would work to get the Bible translated into a language. Well, he was faithful in spreading God's word. But unfortunately, he wasn't viewed as someone who, was, who by the upper echelon of the religious world, he was called a heretic 
by the big, ugly, corrupt church of the time. And the Pope was so disgusted with this guy that after he had died, 44 years after his death, John Wycliffe's death, the Pope ordered Wycliffe's bones to be dug up, to be destroyed again, and then to be spread across the river. I mean, that's how much they hated this man. Some people say that Wycliffe was actually the morning star of the Reformation. I mean, he, had, he was the, the one that God would use to start that ball rolling in the very necessary Reformation of the church. And Wycliffe also had a disciple, uh, 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 another, uh, another student whose name was John Huss. How many of you have ever heard of that name? John Huss. And Huss was equally passionate about getting God's word into as many hands of as many people as possible. Well, unfortunately, Huss too was called a heretic and was actually burned at the stake. But get this. What do you think that they would use to start the fire around Huss as they burned him at the stake? None other than the teacher John Wycliffe's Bibles. I mean, they spread Bibles all around him. And then they lit the Bibles on fire to burn Huss, John Huss at the stake. And, but it was Huss's final words that actually became known as a prophecy that helped direct the future of the church. Because let me just tell you something. You cannot keep God's word from going forth. You can either be in the way of it or you can get out of the way and let God's word work through you. I'm just telling you right now, there is no demon in hell that can keep God's word from going forth. And so at the stake before he was burned... At the stake before he was burned, the last words of John Huss were these, and I want you to read them on the board. And that's exactly what God did. In the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call for reform cannot be suppressed. And in the year 1517, God raised up the man named Martin Luther, who was so fed up with all of the corruption in the church he actually believed that God was calling him to help reform the church. In fact, it was in an All Hallows Eve that Martin Luther took what became known as his 95th Theses. 95 Theses. It was a document with 95 claims of heresy to the Catholic Church. And he took his 95 Theses and he went and he nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church. And people now describe that event as the, the knock that was heard around the world. And so in, in it, Martin Luther wanted to know why only the rich could afford to sin. Why is it that rich people are the only ones that can actually get out of their debt from sin? So he made statements like these in the 95 Theses. He says this, he says, Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better work than buying pardons. I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but at that time, that would have been like actually punching someone in the gut as far as the leadership of the church was concerned. Christians are to be, another one was this, that was the 43rd, by the way, uh, uh, 45th was Christians are to be taught that he who sees a man in need and passes him by and gives his money for pardons purchases not the indulgences of the Pope, but the indignation of God. God used those accusations of heresy to spark what became known as the Res Re uh, Reformation of the Protestant Church. God also used Martin Luther to take the Bible and to translate it into the German language. And he then took the recent invention called the printing press at that time, the invention of Gutenberg, and he developed it to now get the Bible into the hands of the masses. And of course, Luther was a heretic. People wanted to kill him. So he had to spend much of his life on the run, but God used him to spark major changes in the church and to get the word of God into the hands of the masses in spite of those who wanted to kill him. And about that same time, there was another guy, an Oxford professor. His name was John Collette. How many of you have ever heard of John Collette? Very few. And he translated the Bible into English for his Oxford students. And he also taught the Bible in the English language at St. Paul's uh, Cathedral in London. How many of you ever heard of St. Paul's Cathedral in London? It's a very famous place. And the reason it is is because it's, believe it or not, there were over 20,000 people who would pack into that, that cathedral simply to hear the Word of God in a language that they could understand for the very first time. Not only were 20,000 people inside the building, which is crazy if you ever see that building, not only were 20,000 people inside the building, but it said that as many as people, as many people would be outside the building 
were also waiting for their turn to get in on the outside. 20,000 people on the outside waiting to get in. Why? Why? Why would that be? Because they were hungry. They were desperate. They would do anything to simply hear the word of God. What's sad is, you want to hear something sad? Here's what's sad. What's sad is, is today if you look at that same church in London, you know how many people will be there this morning? Instead of 20,000 people being there, there'll be about 200, and most of them are people who are just passing through to actually get an idea of what's happening. They're there to see. They're there to just hang out. They're, they're simply tourists coming through to see what great things happen. And, and so in the year 1526, there was a, a guy named William Tyndale. How many of you have ever heard of a name, guy named William Tyndale who befriended Martin Luther? And God used William Tyndale uh, in spite of things that maybe weren't perfect with him to print the very first English Bible. That's the good news. The bad news is anyone who was caught with uh, the illegal Bible would be executed immediately. And so you could only imagine what demand there would be for a people that read English and wanted to read God's word uh, in the language that they could actually understand instead of Latin. And so they would do almost anything to get God's word into their hands. And these people, they were incredibly creative. And they would smuggle, often they would smuggle Bibles into, the, into England using all sorts of the different means. Um, occasionally they put Bibles in bales of cotton and snuggle them in there. They would do that just to make sure that they could get a Bible. Or other times, they'd put it into bags of flour. Imagine you being desperate enough where you would actually want to get the Word. Not, not only do you want a, a copy of the Word of God yourself, but you would be willing to put your life in danger because you wanted other people to experience what it was that you were actually experiencing. I mean, putting Bibles in flour. Ironically, the biggest buyers of Tyndale's Bibles were actually the king's men. That's right, the king's men would buy up as many English Bibles as they could, not because they wanted to read them, but, but instead because they wanted to burn and destroy all of Tyndale's Bibles. Well, Tyndale, he was a good businessman, and he would simply take the profits of all these Bibles the king's men would buy, and he would use the money to print even more Bibles to get the word of God out. And so unfortunately, because he was doing what, we, what he was doing was uh, considered illegal, Tyndale was on the run for 11 years of his life. I want you to imagine that for a moment. You're on the run for your life, not just you're on the run to avoid having to pay taxes or you're just avoiding trying to not have to, have to uh, meet up with reality. You're not just doing that. Unfortunately, you are trying to survive. Your very life is, 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 in, is in danger. Imagine waking up every single morning knowing that people were hunting you down, wanting to kill you simply because you wanted to help other people experience the Word of God. I mean, that's what Tyndale experienced. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, he was on the run, running for his life because people wanted to execute him. Sadly, they eventually caught up to him and incarcerated him for about 500 days before they finally decided in the year 1536 to burn Tyndale at the stake. His last words, though, were a prayer to God, and I want you to hear these words, which people will remember forever. He prayed this. He said, oh, Lord, would you open the eyes of the king of England? Oh, Lord, open up the eyes of the king, king of England. Not, oh, Lord, can you make this fire not burn? Can you make this fire not be hot? Oh, Lord, can you make this a little easier for me? Oh, Lord, can you do things that actually I like right now? I mean, I really don't like what's happening, and I want something better to happen. Could you just magically remove me from the situation? No. Oh, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And here's what's crazy. Three years later, don't think that prayers don't work because they do. Three years later, in 1539, God answered that prayer. Not only did the king of England allow the printing of the Bible in the English language, but he actually helped to fund it, setting the word of God free. Think about this. Remember all the people who died. Remember all the people who gave their lives fighting with everything in them to help God's living and active word be available to you. And sadly, 
So many people today, they shikak. They shikak. They neglect God's word. They, they take it for granted. They blow it off. They, oh, 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 pastor, just tell me when the fellowship is. Tell me when the time to hang out with other people. I mean, tell me when the food gets passed out. Make sure I'm there for that one. But you know what? The word of God, that's not something people are lining up for. A lot of times what happens is, is we don't realize the reason we don't have a want to is because God's want to in his word hasn't gotten to be a part of our lives so much that we don't have a want to. We don't have a drive. And some of you are like, man, hey, you know, I just really would, I just really want God's word. Well, here's the deal. Here's how you do it. Jump in. Get in God's word. Get in the word of God. Let him light a fire inside of you. The psalmist, I'm reminded of it over and over again. It's who is he? King of the King of Glory. Who is he, the King of Glory, that sets his ministers aflame? Who is it? It's God Almighty. He's strong and he's mighty. There is none that goes beyond his sight. They shakak, neglect the, the word of God, and they really don't know the Bible, and they might even have a form of religion. Some of you may be in this room, you may have a form of religion, and, and it may be, you know, just what it looks like you're a Christian, but maybe you're denying the power of God in your own life because there is no authority other than sola scriptura, the word of God alone, and there is no other authority in sola scriptura than sola Christus. Christ alone. He is the one that can actually fix the issues of the heart. And don't we need him? I mean, instead, he's the word of God. The word of God, he's living, he's active. Scripture says that in the beginning, there was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is Jesus. This is the word. It's becoming flesh. And we begin to flesh it out in our own lives. And there's kind of a symbolism piece there. To know him, to serve him, to actually better follow him. Uh, to, we must feed on the word of God. And yet, so many people neglect it. I delight in your decrees. I delight in your decrees, O God. Psalm 119. What? I will not neglect your word. As Callie and the team come back, I want us to pray this morning. Can we bow our heads and our hearts this morning? Father, we thank you, God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for your word. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you have brought your word to us. Lord, that you have spoken life to us. You have given us life. Through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you use men and and women to bring about your, your word. And we thank you, God, that you care about us enough to bring us your word. Lord, your word, as the word, as your word says, that Lord, it brings life. It brings hope. It brings healing. Father, we thank you for what the thousands and thousands of leaders throughout history have done in order for us to hold your living word in our hands. Thank you for the word that is living and that is active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for that today. Right now, this morning, as we're praying, as we're seeking the Lord, many of you recognize you have neglected God's word and you want to make, you want to make it an active part of your life. That's your desire this morning. As the word of God is being spoken this morning, you realize that maybe you're in a place where you are neglecting the word of God. You are shakaking. You are, you are pushing it away. You are, you're, it's not in your life. It's not where it's supposed to be. It's not in its premier place. And you would say, me as a Christian, as a Christ follower, pastor, I got to be honest, I am neglecting the word of God and I need the word of God to be uh, the biggest part of me. I want that this morning. That's my heart right now. Right now, hands going up everywhere. Just go ahead and just raise your hand right now. Yeah. People everywhere. The God of the God of glory sees your heart. Thank you, Jesus. You've raised your hand this morning. Father, I thank you, God for the deep desire to commit to know you through your word. Those of you who have lifted your hands, I want to just pray over you right now. Lord, we thank you, God, for the deep desire to commit to know you through your word. We commit ourselves. God, we pray that everyone that 
that you've been convicting this morning will have a new passion to seek you daily. God, if we don't know you, then all else is going to be lost. We're not going to be able to have anything to stand on when we get to heaven and we ask, well, or when we're asked, well, what allows you to be here? And the truth is, is there may be those words that we would dread or fear, depart from me for I never knew you. The truth is, is when we don't know you, God, our life is left to only sin because, Lord, the, the wages of sin are death. But your gift of God is the eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you. Lord, I pray for those that this morning would look at this and they would say, I, I got to do this to be a good Christian thing. That's, that's not what you're asking, God. Out of a deep hunger to know you, God, I pray that your truth, your glory, your passion, and your power, Lord, would be revealed in people's lives. God, this morning, with our hands lifted, Lord, with our hearts lifted, we commit as your family of believers to seek you daily. Lord, I pray right now that the individuals in this room, Lord, that are, that are wrestling with, Lord, feeling like they don't know you, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. God, we thank you in advance for all the lives that are going to change because, God, we are learning to know you, follow you, and do your will through your living word. Let the word of God come alive in people's lives. Let the word of God come alive in people's lives, God. Lord, your word is so powerful. Your word is so true. It's so good. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that, Lord, that your people, more than they need food, they would realize that they need your word even more so. I pray that these people, God, that, that are raising their hand today, that are saying, you know what, God, I, I, I have neglected your word. I pray that, Lord God, that the, that the food from heaven, God, would infiltrate their very spiritual pores. Lord, and it would bring nourishment. And, Lord, old things would pass away and all... Behold, all things would become new in their lives, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who gave his very life so that we could know the truth and the truth would set us free. Let me tell you this morning what scripture says as we're still praying. This might be this morning. This might be you. Some of you might say, you know, I, I really don't. I, I don't get much out of reading the Bible. There's times when I, I feel like I, I, I just, I feel like it's just, it's not even, I'm not even connecting with it. Let me tell you what Scripture says. This might be the problem this morning. Scripture says that the God of this age, Satan himself, tries to blind the minds of unbelievers. You may, you, 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 your mind may have been blinded to the truth of God's word. Scripture also says it this way, that, that spiritual things are discerned by spiritual people. And maybe you've never been spiritually born anew. Uh, maybe you read God's word and you tried it and it doesn't make sense to you or you tried to pray and, to God and it seemed like there's a ceiling. Well, the reason is, is maybe there really is a ceiling. It's a spiritual ceiling. Scripture says that all of us, and that includes you, all of us have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. There's this problem that we have. It's called, it's a, it's a cancerous thing called sin. And it's like we're all born with it. And Scripture says that our sin nature, it separates us from a holy God. Scripture says that God is so holy that he cannot even look upon sin. Scripture says that because of this, for God so loved the world, he so loved you this morning. He so loved you that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, his son without sin, to die the perfect death on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. The beautiful thing is, is on the third day, he rose again from the dead, and no other God can claim to do that. No other small G God can claim to do that. Scripture says, but our, our great big G God did. Scripture says that anyone, and that includes you, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You want to be one with God. You want to know Him. You want to drop all of the other pursuits and chase Him this morning. That's where you find yourself this morning. You want Him to forgive you of all of your sins, past and present. Call on the name of the Lord. The, call on the name of the Word of God who's made flesh today. His name is Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus.